Good morning, church. We are going to try this. I have kids in the background playing games and forgetting that they're playing games. I have dogs that are barking. I'm pretty sure at falling leaves. Um, it's an exciting morning to be so early here on a Sunday in Crossville, Tennessee, but we're glad to be with you. We've been talking about politics lately, and we're going to continue talking about politics. But just first, my weekly reminder that we're not talking about politics because I'm trying to influence the way you vote. Uh, if you hear me say my intention is to get you to vote for Democrats or for Republicans or for anyone or to not vote, um, you have misunderstood what I've been trying to say these past few weeks. Rather, what we've been talking about is the fact that Jesus himself was political because politics is just the art of forming community, of being neighborly. And Jesus was eminently political. He was a king with a kingdom commands like love God and love your neighbor, those are political statements. But he was political, as we've been talking about, in ways that were drastically different from everybody around him. And I want to argue that we ought to <clears throat> also have a drastic difference in the way that we look at and think about politics. It's going to change the way we frame the issues, the way we uh, ask questions about the issues, the way we come to answers on various issues. Sometimes it will even determine what the issues we think important are important are. And so we've been talking about the politics of Jesus, particularly that he offers us a politic of the cross, that the cross forms the heart of uh, his way of thinking about community and of being neighbors and of living with one another. And today I want to continue thinking about that. You can catch all of those old ones um, on the Facebook page or on YouTube if you haven't caught them. But today I want to continue thinking about that by thinking about rights. Um, if you're like me, you have seen rights as a pretty major part of the discussion this year as we debate our rights over a variety of things. And so I want to think just for a few minutes, what does it mean for Christians to engage in this notion of rights? And to do that, I want to look at a couple of uh, passages, really a longer extended passage in 1 Corinthians, starting in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. I'm going to set it up for you real quick, and then we'll get into a discussion of <clears throat> rights as we go along. So the Corinthians um, were a congregation that, were, that was fighting about a, a wide variety of things. We've talked about the Corinthians a couple of times in this extended conversation on politics. But when we come to chapter 8, what the Corinthians were fighting about was a subject that at, at first glance has very little meaning for us. Um, the subject they were fighting about was whether or not one could eat meat sacrificed to idols. And the reason they fought about this was because in Corinth, um, historically speaking, one of the only sources of meat in the city was via the pagan temples because people would bring sacrifices into the pagan gods and um, they would burn part of that on the altar, they would cook the rest and it would be a part of ritual mills and festivals and things like that. The extra would then go be sold in the marketplace. And just one of the realities of living in Corinth, unless you were super wealthy, chances are um, the only time that you um, came across meat would be on special occasions such as religious festivals or if you went down to the temple and you participated in one of their you know, liturgical um, worship oriented mills or if you bought meat in the marketplace that had been sourced from the temple. And so with this situation, this reality, the Corinthians, um, the Corinthians had divided into two camps. The first camp looked at the situation and said, um, those gods that the meat was sacrificed to are not real. They are not gods. They do not have our allegiance. As a matter of fact, the meat itself comes from the God we do worship, and meat is just meat. And so no one has any ground to tell us that we can't eat this double bacon cheeseburger because we have been set free in Christ. So the first camp was pro double bacon cheeseburger because meat is meat and no one can tell me otherwise. 
Uh, the second camp was uh, on the opposite side of the issue. Perhaps they grew up in the temples. Perhaps it was a little closer to home to them. And they were the ones who said, but even if these gods aren't real, even if the meat did come from God, the optics are all wrong and you're going to lead people astray. And there's a complex interplay of, of conviction going on here. And you have no right to eat meat sacrificed to idols. It's, it's just wrong. And so in Corinth, this big fight about whether or not one had the right to eat the double bacon cheeseburger had erupted, and they appealed to Paul for answers in this. And so really what is going on in 1 Corinthians chapters 8, 9, and 10 is a discussion of rights. Uh, do I have on the one side the right to eat the double bacon cheeseburger if it has been sourced from one of these temples where it was sacrificed to an idol? On the other side, do I... Um, have the right to deny my sister or brother the privilege of eating the double bacon cheeseburger. What are we supposed to do about this? And as we get started, I want to make a, a, an observation. I think that's at play in Corinth and an observation I think that is also at play in America. And I want to note this because Paul is going to come at it in a fundamentally different way than the way that we normally do. Um, in Corinth and in the modern conversation in America, I want you to understand, and just think about it for a minute, that rights are often the sort of thing that is uh, construed in a freedom from something frame. So if you think about it, those um, who were pro double bacon cheeseburger said, no one can deny me this double bacon cheeseburger. I have a right to this double bacon cheeseburger, and what that means is I am free from someone taking that away from me. And this is the way that we think about rights as well. Um, the First Amendment right is construed as a freedom from something. The freedom of free speech is really to say that the government cannot force me to withhold my speech or the government cannot force me to withhold my expression of religion, so on and so forth. These are freedoms from government oppression or some power doing something that we otherwise would not want them to do. I am free from that threat. And as far as it goes, those are okay. At least they can be okay. There's nothing wrong with them in principle. As a matter of fact, I would rather have those rights as not. Uh, and I'm also, I think, a big fan of living in a society that affords those protections to people without power. I'm a fan of looking at those with the least power and saying, this is what we as a society will do to protect them from those with the most power, because that usually doesn't work out very well. But when Paul talks about freedom, and as such when Paul talks about rights, he's not going to primarily frame it in a freedom from sort of situation. Rather, Paul wants to change the discussion to talk about it in a freedom for sort of situation. So for instance, in 1 Corinthians 8, as I try to explain the difference between these two things, um, Paul would acknowledge that the meat is just meat, that it came from God, that um, there is a sense in which those who were in the pro-double bacon cheeseburger camp were right. They, they did, in Christ, technically have this freedom. And he would acknowledge that. Uh, meat is meat. You can eat the double bacon cheeseburger if you want to, all things being equal. But then, having acknowledged that right that they are free from um, anyone denying them the double bacon cheeseburger... He says, and then he spends the next two chapters on this, by the way, the real discussion is not what you are free from, but what you are free for. Another way of saying that, the question is not about what I have the right to do or what you have no right to keep me from doing, but what should I do and how might I love my neighbor best? And the way we might think about this more theologically as we, we back up is you'll remember that the entire biblical story is one where God creates a good creation and in that creation, there is abundance and there is life and there is thriving and there is blessing. But then when sin and death come into the world, uh, it changes the dynamic. And so now we live in this system that we've been talking about of fear and accusation and power. And all of that is kind of pushed by the reality of death in our world. 
And as those dynamics of fear and accusation and power play out, we see things like the powerful abusing, oppressing those with no powerful. We see the need for things like rights. But all of those things are only necessary because we live in a world controlled by death, because we live in a world that has been broken by sin, that has entered or opened the door for death to enter onto the stage. And so um, all of these discussions about what I can do and what you have no right to keep me from doing, all of these things are a conversation about a world in which death is the reality. Death is the driver of this. You have threatened me. You have wronged me. Therefore, I will react against that. And then you will react against what I have done. And this cycle just keeps going and going and going and going. And one of the things in this world with this reality that the New Testament is insistent on is that what Jesus did when he died on the cross is that he defeated death. And so Paul in uh, Colossians chapter 3, or Colossians chapter 2 rather, for instance, he would say that Christ, um, in dying on the cross, took the powers, the spiritual forces that kind of rule over the brokenness of the world, those who are in charge of the way things are. He says that he defeated them, and he led them on a victorious parade to show off their defeat. They have been defeated, therefore we have been set free. Earlier in Colossians chapter 1, he says that God has rescued us from that power, and he has transferred us into under the authority of his son with whom we have forgiveness and the repentance of sins. The, the Hebrews writer in Hebrews 2, 14 and 15 explicitly says that Jesus defeated the devil who held the power of death and in doing so, he sets us free from the slavery of the fear of death. Listen to that language. He sets us free from the slavery of the fear of death. And so uh, there is a very real sense where Christians have been set free not to just do whatever they want to. And they're not free in the sense that nobody can make them do what they don't want to. This isn't a freedom from sort of situation. But he says, now that you have been set free from death, you are free to live for your neighbor. You don't have to fall into that cycle of fear and accusation and power anymore. You don't have to worry about getting even. You don't have to worry about survival. You don't have to worry about all of the things that they worry about. This is kind of what Jesus is getting at in Matthew chapter 6 when he says, you know, the Gentiles worry about what they're going to eat or what they're going to wear or what they're going to drink or how they're going to put a roof over their head. But in the kingdom, God will provide for you. You don't have to worry about all of those things that uh, would take things away from you, that freedom from frame. So now you are free for the purpose of loving your neighbor. And so at the beginning of 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul would go down and he would list a ton of rights that he has. He says in verse 1, he says, am I not free? And the question is, in the freedom from frame and the freedom for frame, sure, Paul is free. And then he goes on to list um, as many rights as he has. Um, do we have the right to eat and drink, he says in verse 4. Don't we have the right to travel with a wife who believes like the rest of the apostles, the Lord's brothers, and Cephas? Or is it only I and Barnabas who have the right to not work for our living? And he goes on to talk about his rights. And what he comes down to at the end of it all, as he enters this conversation with the Corinthians who are fighting about their rights, and you can't deny me my rights. What are your rights anyway? He says, I'll tell you what, Rights are for, in Christ, rights are for laying down for the sake of your neighbor. And as a matter of fact, anytime you see Paul take up a discussion of his privileges or his prerogatives or his rights, he won't deny that he has them. He won't deny that they are sometimes, even most times, good things. But they are always something he's willing to lay down for the sake of his neighbor's and his loved ones. And so think for just a few minutes about what that looks like in our world today. Think about how that would track onto our conversations about whether or not we should wear masks or whether or not we should social distance or, or whether or not we should act this way or the other way in uh, COVID or how that should think or how that should affect the way we think about 
um, various claims that politicians make as they try to sway us to their side in a given situation. Because so often the, top, the conversation is, someone is trying to take away your rights and you got to do something to stop it. Uh, one of the conversations we've had before, just to give you one brief example before we stop, is that um, back in the spring when everybody in the state stopped gathering, one of the realities is that, and, and I'm proud to say this, at the Fernville Church of Christ, no one had to make us stop gathering. Uh, you, as a congregation, decided early on that you were going to love your neighbor enough to lay down that right to assemble for a short time, to take up a fast, as N.T. Wright was talking about it this week, for a period of time so that we could love our neighbors well. And it hasn't been easy, and it's difficult, and it's not ideal. And I would sure rather exercise my right to assemble. But we chose to lay down our rights because that's who we are in Christ. Okay. So really, this is just another exercise in kenosis, that first move of love. And it changes the way we think about everything. It is not freedom from that we are concerned with. It's freedom for. And we are free to love our neighbors because we don't have to worry about that old cycle of fear and accusation and power and death. And that is a political move. So I've got a time limit on these files with this new camera, and I'm about out of time. So let's pray. God, we thank you so much for setting us free. Thank you for the hope that we have in the resurrection of Christ. I pray that you would help us to live free from the fear of death, and that our neighbors would be benefited and blessed by the light that you shine through us. And we come to you and we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory now and forever. Amen. So remember who we are. We shall love the Lord our God with all our heart, and with all our soul, and with all our mind, and with all our strength. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second commandment is like it. We shall love our neighbor as ourselves. All of the law and the prophets hang on these two commands. We love because God first loved us. And anyone who says that they love God but hates their brother or sister is a liar. How are you going to love God whom you have never seen if you don't love your brother or sister who is right in front of you? So this is the command we have from him. Those who love God must also love their brother and sister. Church, we love you. Have a good week.